Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is Lisa Whitehead, and this is the very last lecture in Bio 205 at Illinois Central College. The chapter we're studying today is chapter 29 in our text, and we'll be looking at development and inheritance. Now, you'll probably note that the lecture outcomes for today are actually considerably fewer than in other chapters. However, this is still a full-length lecture. And that's because this content is just going to be so important in your lives, both personally and also in your professional practice. So you might remember there's that survey that I just sent out to you a little while ago. And in it, I received some feedback that was suggesting that I include more clinical correlations and more personal stories to try to make the stories bloom for you. So I'm doing just that today. You're going to see images of my son when I was pregnant, um, all sorts of interesting things about the development and inheritance component of my son. Um, I hope you like it. I hope you find it interesting. I love this chapter. I hope you love it too. And if you have any questions whatsoever, please talk to me. The final is just around the corner and I'm here for you to help you get through it. I think you're in great shape at this point, but if you have any questions, as always, email me and we can Zoom. Let's get started. The learning outcomes for today's lecture include to describe the major events of the pre-embryonic or germinal period, the embryonic period, and the fetal period, to describe the functional importance of the placenta and the umbilical cord, define, identify, and explain the present and future function of the following, the inner cell mass, the trophoblast, chorionic villi, the extra embryonic membranes, which includes the yolk sac, the allantois, the chorion, amnion, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm, to define the following terms and describe the location and timing in which each may occur. Fertilization, blastocyst, gastrulation, cleavage, and the pre-embryonic or germinal period, and to describe the major events of each of the three gestational periods. Also, to understand the impact of syncytiotrophoblast hormone synthesis, to describe the structural and functional maternal adaptations to pregnancy, which include changes in the respiratory, the digestive, the urinary, and the reproductive systems. Describe the stages of childbirth. Differentiate between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Understand the value of colostrum for the neonate. And then lastly, your very last lecture outcome of the semester, to apply the rules of simple inheritance to determine patterns of inheritance for dominant, recessive, and sex-linked traits. In today's lecture, like all of our other lectures, we're going to proceed through the chapter in order, so that way if you want to follow along with your text, you can. If you would like to go back and re-listen to any section, it should be organized accordingly for you to do so in an organized fashion. So starting off, we're going to look at prenatal and postnatal development. Then we're going to move into how a fertilization moves from being two independent gametes into a zygote. Then we're going to discuss gestation, which is the period of development intrauterinely. And then we'll discuss the first trimester, which is the embryonic period. Then we'll talk about the second and third trimesters together. This is the fetal period, at which point the organs are already formed, but they still have to specialize and become a little bit more developed. Then we'll discuss what happens to the mother during this period. What are maternal gestational changes that occur? Then we'll discuss childbirth and then the postnatal stages of development. And then finally, we'll discuss patterns of inheritance. So in general, what we're talking about in today's lecture is period of development. So we're going to be looking at development both prenatally and postnatally. And natal is just referring to birth, so that means everything up to birth is prenatal, and everything after birth is postnatal development. So development in general is characterized as just a gradual number of changes in which our anatomical structures and our physiology changes and it just kind of modifies bit by bit starting at fertilization extending all the way through to full maturity and so starting off with the prenatal period of development this includes both the embryonic period and the fetal developmental stages those are two totally separate stages although of course it's part of a continuum as is aging in general but the embryonic period is when we're forming all of our organs and becoming a humanoid structure. And by the time we're fetal, all of those organs are actually developed, but they're not developed and matured fully. So it is during the fetal period in which the organs actually 
become much more mature and at the very least are mature in the terms of what is required for a baby to actually have. Then there is postnatal development, which is expected to be at around 40 weeks, at which point you have an infant who is alive and born and healthy. And at that point, they're going to continue developing, as of course, an infant is not a six foot tall human. (laughs) So they'll continue to grow. And this continues up until the point of complete maturity, at which point the state of development is complete, or we'll say that their growth is complete. Pre-embryonic development is defined as the development that occurs before we actually have an embryo. So an embryo exists between the third and eight weeks of life. But before that, we actually don't truly have an embryo. We have two gametes. So we have the male sperm and the female secondary oocyte that will meet, fertilize, and then they proceed through this process to become an embryo. So the embryo occurs between the third and eighth week, and then the fetal development occurs starting at the ninth week. So that pre-embryonic period of development is kind of complicated. We're gonna go through this in a little bit more detail coming up in the following slides. But the general idea is that these are the processes that will occur in the first two weeks after fertilization, and this is what produces the embryo. So the embryonic period, this is when we're developing all of our organs that occurs between the third and eight weeks, and this is a period of time in which there is a great amount of change. So embryology is a field of study that studies this specific period of time only. It looks at the third through the eighth weeks of life. Fetal development is how we develop a fetus from the embryo. So this is the period of maturation that starts at that ninth week and then continues on until delivery. If any of you who are listening have already had a child, you're probably already familiar with this. But this is the sort of thing that if you haven't had a child yet, you may not have ever heard of it before. So this is the sort of additional tidbit I want you to know. There's a difference between the developmental age and the clinical or also known as gestational age. So we often refer to how many weeks somebody is pregnant. So we'll say, oh, there's 40 weeks in a pregnancy. So, you know, if they're two months pregnant, they're, you know, eight weeks pregnant, right? So that means the baby would be eight weeks gestational age. Okay, true, technically, but keep in mind, the first two weeks of any human's life is technically still as a gamete. So what that means is the developmental age is really counting specifically from the very first day at which the gametes meet. So from fertilization. So really in the developmental age, there is only 38 weeks between fertilization to birth. Whereas in the clinical age or gestational age, we count from the last known menstrual period, which is 40 weeks to birth. So that's why there's a difference in some of the things you might read where they might say that you know, oh, it takes 40 weeks to have a baby or 38 weeks. That's the difference. We're looking at between developmental age taking 38 weeks from fertilization or from the clinical or gestational age taking 40 weeks from the last menstrual period. And keep in mind that the first day of a menstrual period is technically day one of the cycle. So that's how we count these things. So what we're doing with the developmental age is we're looking at the gestational age and we're subtracting two weeks, which is 14 days, which is pretty average for the most part, to allow for that period of time in between that first day of the last known menstrual period up until ovulation. So therefore, we're looking at a calculation that looks like when ovulation occurred, pardon me, when ovulation occurred, and then we add 266 days or 38 weeks. Now, if we look at the clinical age or the gestational age, what we're doing is we're starting at the last menstrual period, which is day one. And from day one through until delivery, if we go full period, that is 40 weeks. So we're calculating the age of the embryo with the clinical age or the gestational age from the very first day of the last normal menstrual period, which is abbreviated LNMP. So we're taking LNMP plus 280 days or 40 weeks. Some of the big concepts that we talk about in this chapter will be differentiation, inheritance, and genetics. Differentiation is how we all have different types of cells in our body, but through development, we create a number of different cell types arising from just a few types of stem cells. And so because of these very specific selective changes in our genetics, it will allow for some genes to be turned on, others are turned off, and as a result, we end up developing muscle tissue and 
not just muscle tissue, smooth muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue, and that's just three different types of muscle. So as you recall from our lecture on the different types of tissues, you've realized how many different types of connective tissue we have, right? So this all occurs during development through these changes in genetic activity, turning some genes on, others off, allowing our tissue to differentiate from the three main types into all of the different types of tissues that we have now. Inheritance is also commonly referred to as heredity. And what inheritance is, is just taking information that's genetically from our parents. And those characteristics will be passed down generation to generation. And genetics is the study of what are the mechanisms responsible for people to inherit those different characteristics and traits. Let's look at section 29.2, how we go from fertilization with two gametes to form a zygote. Fertilization is defined as the fusion of two haploid gametes. So each of those two haploid gametes will have 23 chromosomes. And together, when the secondary oocyte and the sperm meet, they'll produce a zygote. And that zygote will contain a full complement of genetic material for a human, which is 46 chromosomes. The sperm will have the paternal chromosomes to deliver, and so they'll provide that. And the sperm, of course, are very small cells, and you can see that there are a lot of them in this image to the right, all surrounding the secondary oocyte. And then the female gamete is the oocyte, and this oocyte has everything it needs to support the development of an embryo for up to a week. The secondary oocyte is the true gamete of the female reproductive system, and it's released by the ovary at ovulation. At this time, it's surrounded by something called the zona pellucida. And look at the word lucid inside the word pellucida. It's a clear area. And this is a thick glycoprotein-rich envelope that is there to protect that oocyte. There's also an area called the corona radiata, which radiates out. And what this does is it's a protective layer of follicle cells that's just outside of the zona pellucida. And this has an important role in the acrosome reaction, which is as the sperm enters into the secondary oocyte. The image on the right is from the textbook of the previous edition. And I really like this image because it gives you a clear linear view of what happens in order. So fertilization is of course when we have sperm meeting oocyte, right? And you can see here what happens day by day and as it travels along. So we know here, looking at this image without even knowing anything else, the ovary ovulates, that secondary oocyte, it travels along through the fallopian tube, starting by the fimbria and moving along, heading towards the main component of the uterus. So you see day zero, there it is in the fallopian tube, and you can see fertilization occurring as a number of sperms are right around that secondary oocyte. So because they have now joined, we now have a zygote just above that, and then as it travels along through the fallopian tube, you see day one, day two, day three, day four. By day four, we've had enough activity within that zygote that there are multiple cells present. And amorula is defined as a cell ball, basically. And so by day four, we have a ball of cells, but still floating along. So keep this in mind. If you're thinking that a couple days after ovulation, you should be able to test for pregnancy to be able to identify if you're pregnant, there are no chemical changes possible yet at this point because at day four, what's happening is you may have a ball of cells, but it is not implanted in the wall yet. So at this point, technically not pregnant. Sperm and egg can meet, but until they implant, you will not have a positive HCG pregnancy test. HCG is human chorionic gonadotropin, and that is the standard thing that we test for in all pregnancy tests, whether it's urine or in blood. Either way, so you can see day four, not implanted. However, as we move down towards day seven, you can see that we now have a blastocyst that implants in the wall of the uterine lining and an embryo begins to form. So fertilization is defined as what occurs in the uterine tube or fallopian tube within a day of ovulation. So at this point, we have a secondary oocyte that only travels a little while, 
But as it's traveling along, it's going to run into sperm, provided they're available. And what they do is they have to swim all the way from the superior aspect of the vagina through the cervix into the uterus and up into the uterine tubes. Hence the reason for why they need all that energy. So the sperm cover all that distance and then arrive at the location of the ova, sorry, of the secondary oocyte, where she is in the uterine tube. Capacitation is what has to happen before the sperm can fertilize a secondary oocyte. So it comes into contact with secretions from the seminal glands and also the exposure to the conditions in the female reproductive tract, which are a little more acidic, also help in capacitation for the sperm. As the sperm approaches the secondary oocyte, the sperm has to actually break through that outer aspect of the secondary oocyte and penetrate the corona radiata to reach the surface of the oocyte. So there are two different enzymes that are protein digesting, and that is hyaluronidase and acrosin. And both of those have a very important role in being able to allow a sperm to break through so that way fertilization can occur. Also, oocyte activation is important. This is triggered by the fusion of the sperm and the oocyte membranes. Once the sperm and the oocyte membranes had fused, now we can have an oocyte activation. So at this point, what we have are sodium ions that rush into the oocyte and it depolarizes the membrane. And this results in calcium being released from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And this causes three distinct things. The first is exocytosis. So the vesicles that are right next to the oocyte membrane will basically spit out all of those products. Then we also have the end of meiosis II, and at this point, at the end of meiosis II, we have the formation of the second polar body. And the third thing is that we have the activation of enzymes that will rev up the metabolic rate. In the cortical reaction, enzymes are released that will inactivate sperm receptors. So essentially, that reduces the number of docking stations at which a sperm could dock. And then secondly, it hardens the zona pellucida. Both of these together result in a block to polyspermy, which is just preventing more than one sperm from fertilizing the same oocyte. And then finally, once this oocyte has completed meiosis II, now it can be known as a mature ovum. At this point, oocyte activation has completed and meiosis has completed as well for the female gamete. And so now the nuclear material that is inside the ovum reorganizes and it does this into what is called the female pronucleus. So at this point, we also have changes occurring, of course, in the male gamete. So the nucleus of the sperm swells and forms the male pronucleus. At this point, though, the rest of the sperm is going to break down, except for the centrosomes, because those, of course, have an important role in DNA replication. But at this point, we don't really need the tail anymore, right? So that's why it would break down. And now as the female pronucleus and the male nucleus, sorry, male pronucleus move towards one another, they are chemo attracted to one another. And then we finally get to a point at which the male and the female chromosomes mixed together and that is called amphimixis. Amphimixis is defined as the fusion of the female pronucleus and the male pronucleus. So truly, the moment of conception is really when we have genetic material from the male gamete meeting the genetic material from the female gamete. So at this point, amphimixis is when we have two separate gametes that are haploid becoming a cell that is known as a zygote that is diploid with 46 chromosomes. So at the point of amphimixis, fertilization is complete. And the first cleavage that occurs will produce two daughter cells, which are known as blastomeres. At ovulation, there are two things that are released from the ovary that the fimbria of the uterine tube are going to pick up. The first is the secondary oocyte and the other is the first polar body. So both of these things are together, and as you can see in this image, you can see that the corona radiata, all of those little cells that radiate around that main structure, those are all, all around both the first polar body and the secondary oocyte. Then, if the oocyte is to encounter sperm, what will happen is the sperm will try to basically get in, and there are enzymes at the tip of the head of each sperm 
And those acrosomal enzymes are going to basically break down the wall of that secondary oocyte. So next one will finally ultimately get in. And when that happens, then we have oocyte activation in which we have hardening of the zona pellucida, as well as we have other things occurring that prevent polyspermy. And so at this point now, that secondary oocyte completes meiosis and is now considered a mature ovum. Next, we have the nucleus of the fertilizing sperm inside of this cell, and it starts to break down. And then we have the first cleavage. So the genetic material comes together, getting ready for the mixing of genetic material. Amphimixis finally is that fusion of the female pronucleus and the male pronucleus. And this is considered to be the true moment of conception at which the maternal and paternal chromosomes, which is the genetic material, actually align along the metaphy sorry, metaphase plate, getting ready to divide. And then lastly, what you'll finally see is that there are those centrioles and they also have their uh, spindle formations. All of those are going to be getting ready to start pulling the chromatin towards the center to get ready for its first cell division. Now let's discuss gestation. Gestation is the time that is spent in prenatal development. So this is everything from day zero all the way through to delivery. And it includes three integrated trimesters that blend together. So this is not a separated, segmented occurrence. The three trimesters blend together. They're each about three months long and result in a nine month pregnancy. So these images that you see below demonstrate for you the first, second and third trimesters Although the third image that you see on the right is very early on in the third trimester, because as you approach the midpoint and the later stages of the third trimester, the fetus becomes so large that really all you can see on ultrasound is one major component of the body at a time. Whereas you can see at the image on the left, you can see you have an entire embryo present in the first trimester early on. What we're looking at here, by the way, in these three images, these are all pictures of my Ezra. In the first trimester, starting at the pre-embryonic period all the way through to early field development, we have the beginning of all of the major organ systems starting to develop from absolutely nothing up into something that is beginning to function and to appear as though it's a normal structure. During the second trimester, what we have is these organs and organ systems that develop and become much more mature. And during this time, you look at these structures and think, yes, this looks like a baby. <laughs> and during the third trimester, there is a rapid period of growth, at which point the fetus is getting all sorts of different maturity and all sorts of different structures occurring. And adipose tissue is depositing to give this infant some insulation for temperature control and regulation for extra uterine life. During the third trimester, most of the major organ systems are fully functional, but not up until the very end of the third trimester, which is one of the reasons why, even though, yes, a baby can live extra uterinely in a neonatal intensive care unit, no problem. Truly, it is absolutely best for every single infant, unless there are some extenuating circumstances, to spend as much time in utero as possible, because that is the perfect housing to be able to develop all of the different major organ systems that need to be fine-tuned and to become fully mature prior to birth. Let's discuss the first trimester. The first trimester extends from day zero through to the ninth week of pregnancy. And during that time, there are four things that need to occur. The first is cleavage, which is really just one cell meeting the other. They fuse and cells continue to propagate from there. The second thing that has to happen is implantation, which is that the conceptus needs to implant in the uterine lining of the endometrial tissue. So that has to happen before anything further can occur. Once it implants, then the placenta can begin to form in a process known as placentation. And then finally, now that we have nutrient support from the endometrium, we can begin the process of forming an embryo through the process of embryogenesis.
Cleavage is a sequence of cell divisions that starts immediately after fertilization occurs, at which point a zygote, so we have the male and female gametes fusing to become a zygote, so the zygote then becomes a pre-embryo, at which point then it can develop into a multicellular blastocyst. And this really doesn't look like much. The blastocysts are really just a ball of cells. They're very unattractive. They don't really resemble anything that we could attach a sense of identification to. But this cleavage will end when the blastocyst finally comes into contact with the uterine wall and begins the process of implantation. So when implantation occurs, the blastocyst has attached to the endometrium of the uterus, and this sets us up to allow the formation of an embryonic structure. The images that you see on the right, by the way, are very, very, very interesting to me because one of the two of them is my son Ezra now. The other one, I don't know. I don't know which one is which, but either way, these are the two early morulas or blastocysts that were implanted in me during in vitro fertilization, and one of them became my now two-year-old son Ezra, and the other one unfortunately did not make it. But I want you to be able to see that this is exactly what it looks like. Placentation is what occurs as the blood vessels start to wrap around the periphery of the blastocyst. And what this does is it allows for exchange between the maternal blood and the embryonic blood. So this allows for things like gas exchange and for nutrients to be exchanged, as well as for waste to be released as well. Embryogenesis is the formation of a viable embryo, and embryogenesis sets up the foundation for all of the major organ systems to develop. So during embryogenesis, those organ systems develop, but it is during the fetal period where all of those major organ systems mature and become functional. The image that you're seeing on the right is a classic singleton placenta. You will see a single umbilical cord extending from roughly the bottom left mid-center aspect of the disc. We're looking at this point at the fetal aspect. So you can see that there is a normal arborization of, I would say, medium caliber vessels extending out over the entire, pardon me, entire fetal surface of the placenta. So in my personal professional opinion, I would say this looks pretty great. If you're looking at the top and you see that there are some areas that look like they're tan and opaque and a little more like there's something like gunky looking under the surface. That's just chorion deposition, not a big deal, totally normal part of development. The first trimester is known as the most dangerous prenatal stage because during this time, there is so much happening and so much could go wrong. So what this results in is really only about 40% of all conceptions that occur will produce an embryo that survives the first nine weeks or the first trimester. So we could have a number of things that occur ranging from, let's say we have sperm meets secondary oocyte, but they don't implant, or sperm meets oocyte and it implants, but doesn't form a placenta. And all of these things generally occur for reasons that are understood to be because of genetic malformations or mutations. And so as a result, 100% of pregnancies that occur do not result in an actual delivery of a child, and primarily this is because during the first trimester, a fertilization that occurs does not result in survival. However, should it survive, then what happens is we have both cleavage and blastocyst formation during the first trimester. So blastomeres are the identical cells that are produced by cleavage, which is just basically cells replicating and then and dividing. And then a morula is what is formed after we have three days of cells replicating. So this goes from two cells becoming four cells to becoming eight cells. So at this point, a morula is a pre-embryo of solid cells in a ball. And everybody always says this resembles a mulberry, but I still have not met a single person who knows what a mulberry looks like. So suffice it to say, it looks basically like a blackberry, if you want to think of it that way, because I think we all know what a blackberry looks like. I still don't honestly know what a mulberry looks like. So this morula will then reach the uterus on day four or day five. Finally, we have blastocyst formation, and a blastocyst is something that is formed from the morula. So the morula was our blackberry or mulberry or whatever type of berry it is, and that morula is a ball of cells packed in densely, but now we need to have some things occur inside of this structure to develop 
an embryo eventually. So we need to create some space for things like amniotic fluid, space for the embryo to develop. So what happens is the blastocyst forms from the morula into a hollow ball, in which case we have the inner cavity, which is called a blastocele. And now the blastomeres are no longer identical. We also have something called the trophoblast. And in the trophoblast, we have outer layers of the cell of the blastocyst. And these trophoblastic cells provide the nutrients to the developing embryo. So if the trophoblast is providing nutrients and support, we also have to have a structure that is receiving the support, and that is the inner cell mass. So the inner cell mass is going to be basically clustered off at one end of the blastocyst, and it's exposed only to the blastocele. So the inner cell mass, which is going to become the embryo, is insulated from contact with anything else, especially uterine life, and it's surrounded by the trophoblast. Figure 29.2 shows you the general layout again of what happens when. So first off, we have fertilization occurring at what we call day zero. And technically, in a female menstrual cycle, this would be considered about day 14. So an ovulation occurs, then it becomes fertilized within a very short period of time. So that's day zero. From there, what we have is the two cell stage that occurs around day one and takes an entire day until about day two, until those two cells have duplicated and then starts picking up the pace. By day three, now it's doubled again, so it goes from four to eight. And at this point then, day four, we have the advanced morula, which will probably have something like 16 cells, give or take, in a ball. The zona pucida forms. And then finally, by about day six and day seven, we're getting ready to actually implant in the uterine wall. And so you can see two distinct things occurring around day six. We have an inner cell mass that will become a lot of the embryonic structures, and then we have all of this space, the blastocele. And so those two things are forming. So there's distinctly tissue that will become eventually an embryo and other space that will be there to be able to support the developing conceptus. So it's not until day seven to 10 in which you have implantation in the uterine wall. So just if you're ever thinking about testing for HCG, keep in mind that if somebody were to theoretically be sexually active at day zero, at a fertilization day, and if everything were to line up perfectly, so if day zero is equivalent of day 14, you can go forwards an entire week, and that's only the very first day at which that conceptus could possibly implant. So at that point, there's not a lot of hormone interaction yet, and so you're not going to see a lot of production of ACG from the syncytiotrophoblast. It will take a little bit more time, so that's why testing too early can give you a false negative. When implantation occurs, it's typically between days 7 to 10 after fertilization. So again, with the female menstrual cycle, that would be day 0 equaling day 14 of the menstrual cycle. So let's add 7 days on, so this would be like day 21 to day 24, roughly. So during this time, then the blastocyst adheres, and the trophoblastic cells are going to divide very rapidly, and this creates several different layers within the structure. There's both the syncytotrophoblasts and the cytotrophoblasts. So the cytotrophoblasts are those cells that are going to be closest to the interior of the blastocyst. And the syncytotrophoblasts are the outer layer. And so keep in mind that the placental tissue arises out of the syncytotrophoblasts, which makes sense for them to be at the perimeter because that's what has to have contact with the uterine wall. Trophoblastic channels that carry maternal blood are called lacuna, and these form as well as villi. And the villi are going to extend from the trophoblast into the endometrium. And these will continue to grow, both in size and number and complexity, up until about day 21. And then the amniotic cavity also is worth discussing. So the amniotic cavity, of course, holds amniotic fluid. So it's a fluid-filled chamber, and it's created as that inner cell mass starts breaking free away from the trophoblast. So this is layered right next to that most superficial layer of the inner cell mass, because it's right next to the developing conceptus. And then the deeper layer is going to be exposed to the blastocele. An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that occurs anywhere outside the uterus. So ultimately what we're saying is it's in an abnormal location because it should be housed within the uterus. This happens somewhat commonly, up to 0.6% of all pregnancies. And unfortunately, it is both not a viable embryo and it is also potentially life-threatening to the mother. So here's why. If you look down at the image below, you're going to see over at the far right, 
that tubal pregnancies are going to be listed as being about 95% of ectopic pregnancies. So in that case, if you have implantation in the uterine tube, what ends up happening is as that embryo develops and becomes larger and larger, and the blood supply rushes into that area, this is going to very quickly outgrow the space available. And unfortunately, at a certain point, if there is no medical intervention, what will happen almost certainly is a rupture of the blood supply, and then therefore both the embryo will be lost and the mother may bleed out and die as well. So this is one of the reasons why ectopic pregnancies are a true medical emergency requiring immediate medical attention. And because we're talking about placentas, I want to give you another clinical correlation about where that placenta implants, because this is incredibly important for the overall health and well-being of the fetus as it develops and when it's delivered. So in this image here, what you'll note is on the far left, a normal placenta is in the head down position, ready to be delivered. And you can see that the placenta is up towards the fundus at the more superior aspect. And this is great because that means that when we have delivery, First comes the baby, and then second comes the placenta. Now, in the second situation, which is the middle image, you'll notice that in between the placenta and the uterine wall, that there's a collection of blood. And FYI, this actually happened to me when I was pregnant two times. <laughs> so this can be a true medical emergency, or it can be something that you can watch and wait and keep an eye on if it's not terribly fast as a bleed. And so the risk here, of course, is that if you have too much tear in between the placenta and the uterine wall, you can end up with a giant collection of blood called a hematoma. And when that occurs, it separates the ability from the placenta to attach to the uterine wall. And therefore, you don't have the blood exchange that is required and it's possible to lose the pregnancy. And in the third instance, what we're looking at here is if the placenta implants along the most inferior aspect of the uterine wall. So here you can see it's right down by the cervix. The problem occurs when the baby comes to be delivered. Everything can be going along swimmingly up until that point. So as soon as it's time for delivery, what happens? Well, we know the cervix dilates. And so when that happens, there's an immediate tear, right, in the placenta's attachment to the uterine wall. And so as that occurs, you end up with bleeding, and that bleeding can result in both a loss of gas exchange for the fetus, so that could be a, a total death for the fetus, and also that bleeding can be severe and can also cause death to the mother. So placenta previa is one of the indications for a cesarean section. During the embryonic period, which is from implantation all the way up until week nine, there are two things that are occurring. The first is differentiation. And differentiation is that we have all sorts of changes occurring in the genetics of some cells, but it's also not occurring in others. So what this means is that we have some cells that are our stem cells that are the basis of all of the cells of our body that will divide into a variety of different types of specialized cells but they're not all going to be the same. Some will be muscular cells, some are going to be collagenous, connective tissue cells, et cetera, et cetera. Further, we also have induction. And in induction, we have cells that will release a certain chemical substance, and that can affect the differentiation of other embryonic cells. And induction is involved in some very highly complicated processes. In early embryogenesis, gastrulation is the process by which the third layer of cells in the embryo develops. And this occurs through a process called cell migration when cells are moving around to different locations before they settle into their final resting place. And then once they're there, they're going to bend and fold and bend and fold a gazillion different times until we develop all of the organs that we would expect to see at the end of the first trimester. So the three germ layers that form through gastrulation are the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm, which you can see here at the image on the right. Of the three germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm, let's first look at the ectoderm and what it contributes. So the ectoderm is our most external layer to our body. And so the ectoderm will develop our integumentary system, our skeletal system, and our nervous system because these are all things that are more exterior to the body. The integumentary system includes all the structures of our hair, our skin, our nails, and the glands that communicate with our skin. 
The skeletal system will include things like the pharyngeal cartilages and also even their derivatives, including auditory ossicles. So remember, those are the bones within our ear that allow us to hear. And then furthermore, the nervous system as well. The ectodermal layer also contributes to our endocrine system, our respiratory system, as well as the digestive system. So in the endocrine system, this includes the pituitary gland and the adrenal medulla. In the respiratory system, this includes the mucous epithelium, so this is the lining because it's ectoderm of the nasal passageways. And in the digestive system, again, because this is the lining, the ectoderm, this includes the mucous epithelium of the mouth and the anus, and also includes the salivary glands. The contribution of the mesodermal layer is in the integumentary system, because this is a deeper layer. This will include the dermis and the hypodermis, not the epidermis. And in the skeletal system, this will include all of the structures except for some of the pharyngeal derivatives that we just discussed that are produced by the ectoderm layer. And in the muscular system, everything is mesodermal. Further, in the endocrine system, the adrenal cortex, as well as the endocrine tissues of the heart, kidneys, and gonads are all contributions of the mesodermal system. And in the cardiovascular system, all structures, as well as all structures of the lymphatic system, are all mesodermal derivatives. And because we have a lot of innards, there is more that is from the mesodermal layer. In the urinary system, our kidneys, which includes the nephrons, which are our functional unit of the kidney, as well as initial portions of the collecting systems, these are all part of the mesodermal layer, as well as the reproductive system. So our gonads and our adjacent portions of the duct systems related to this, these derive from the mesodermal layer. And there's a few other miscellaneous things. So for example, the lining of our pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal cavities, which makes sense that those would be mesodermal. And then the connective tissues that support all of our organ systems are also mesodermal. The contributions of the endodermal layer include, within the endocrine system, the thymus, the thyroid gland, and the pancreas. Within the respiratory system, our respiratory epithelium, but that excludes the nasal passageways, and the associated mucous glands of the respiratory epithelium. And then in the digestive system, the mucous epithelium excluding the mouth and anus, and the excrement glands, but again, now we're excluding the salivary glands, and this also includes the liver and the pancreas. Lastly, the endodermal layer also contributes to the urinary system as well as to the reproductive system. The urinary system allows for the urinary bladder and for the most distal portions of the duct system. And the endodermal layer also provides for the reproductive system, which includes distal portions of our duct system and stem cells that produce gametes, which includes both our ova and sperm. Both of the images that you're looking at here are ovarian teratomas, or the lay term for these is dermoid cyst. And so what this is, is basically an attempt at parthenogenesis, which is the production of an entire human being strictly from the genetic material present in the female, which, by the way, is the basis for Jurassic Park, if you're ever interested in watching that movie. But anyway, this is an attempt on our body to produce an entire human out of only the genetic material present in our ovaries without any reproductive material from a male whatsoever. And because there's a lot of information on the X, that's great. We end up with a lot of constituent parts. Unfortunately, it's not very well organized. So what you're looking at in the image on the left is a tumor that has a whole row of teeth. It looks like almost an entire maxilla, really. Um, I've seen these in the lab that include neural tissue. On the right, you see this with hair and teeth and cartilage and skin. That's all completely normal. Whenever you see these, these are wild looking tumors. And honestly, I have a cool story to tell you. I know a very specific person who worked in a laboratory, and because I won't violate HIPAA, I will not tell you where or when or whom or anything like that. But the one thing I can tell you is that it was at Halloween, and this ovarian teratoma was an entire jaw, which is pretty neat. So anyways, these are basically when we have all three germ layers, but they're not organized. So you have the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm all differentiating to create all these different types of tissues. Unfortunately, this is not a viable structure of any sort.
Now let's discuss the embryonic disc. So this is the three-layered sheet that is somewhat in the shape of an oval and produced by gastrulation that forms. And ultimately, the embryonic disc will be what forms the body of the embryo as well as all of the internal organs. Now the rest of the blastocyst is gonna be a part of the extra embryonic membranes, meaning the membranes that are outside of the embryo, so they are outside of a developing human. So the folding and the differential growth that occurs is gonna produce these bulges, and these bulges are gonna project into the amniotic cavity. And so you have two different folds that are really major. There's the head fold at the cranial end and the tail fold at the caudal end. The extra embryonic membranes that develop in week three are gonna support both embryonic as well as fetal development. And they have four components. So within the extra embryonic membranes, there's the yolk sac, the amnion, the allantois, which is a French word, not allantois, just by the way, as well as chorion. So we're gonna discuss each of these in the subsequent slides. The yolk sac starts out as a layer of cells and it spreads out and eventually it forms a complete pouch, basically. And this is the primary nutrient source for early embryonic development. In fact, early on when I was doing IVF, I had all sorts of ultrasound imaging done extremely early. In fact, earlier than what most people would probably have. And so as a result, I was able to see a really massive yolk sac at one point. And at this point, the embryo was really tiny and the yolk sac looked even bigger than it. So it was a little bit confusing for me, even though I've studied embryology at the graduate level, I still couldn't wrap my brain around why the embryo was smaller than the yolk sac, but that's okay. This happens, it's just part of normal development. So the yolk sac is an important site of blood cell formation for the developing embryo. The amnion is derived of both mesodermal and ectodermal tissues. And the ectodermal cells first are gonna spread over that inner surface of the amniotic cavity, and then hot on their trails, in comes the mesodermal cells. So this will continue and it enlarges throughout early development until we have amniotic fluid that's produced. And that amniotic fluid has an enormous role because what it does is it provides a lot of support and protection for that developing conceptus. So the developing embryo and eventually fetus enjoys the cushioning that's produced by that amniotic fluid. So keep in mind, clinical correlation, when we refer to somebody's water as breaking, what we're referring to is the amniotic fluid specifically. And as soon as the amniotic fluid is expelled out of the vagina, indicating that we have a rupture, what this means is that we now have an easy venue for bacteria into the area where the conceptus is. So the rupture and therefore water breaking is an indication that delivery needs to occur within a certain amount of time, typically within a day or two, because if it doesn't, ultimately we're gonna worry about infection. The Ellen Trois starts off just as an out pocket of endodermal derivative tissue near the base of the yolk sac. And so the free endodermal tip is gonna to grow towards the wall of the blastocyst, and eventually it becomes surrounded by a mass of mesodermal tissue. Later on, the base is gonna give rise to our urinary bladder. The chorion is really what occurs when the mesoderm associated with the allantois spreads out around the blastocyst. And this separates out the cytotrophoblast from the blastocyst. In the chorion, you're going to see blood vessels develop, which is the very first step of creating an actual working placenta. So by the third week, the chorionic villi are going to reach the maternal tissues in the blood vessels, and then those in a large. And once those chorionic villi get bigger and they branch out, they're gonna form a discrete placenta, which is our exchange platform in between the mother and the fetus. During week two, the main thing that occurs is that the mesoderm migrates. So it migrates around the outside of the amniotic cavity. It also migrates around the endodermal pouch, and that helps to form the yolk sac. So at this point, the mesoderm is very active. And then in week three, the embryonic disc is gonna extend out. So from the amniotic cavity, and then the allantois also is an extension of that. And it will extend, surrounded by mesoderm, towards the trophoblast. In week four, now we've got an embryo that's got a head fold and a tail fold, which is still kind of difficult to discern when you look at it. But nonetheless, at this point, 
there are constrictions that are occurring in between the embryo and then the surrounding yolk stock and body stock. So this is the pinching off separating of what it will become the umbilical cord and what will become the embryo. If week five, now the developing embryo is starting to look a little bit more obvious in terms of what it is. And so there are extra embryonic membranes that bulge towards and into the uterine cavity. So the embryo is going to be moving away from the placenta, and then that body stock and yolk stock are going to essentially become the very beginning of an umbilical stock at this point. By the time we get to week 10, you can see now that this is distinctly looking more humanoid. The amnion is considerably expanded, and so now the uterine cavity is almost completely filled, and it starts off being quite small. Keep in mind that a normal non-gravid or non-pregnant uterus would be something about the size of your tightest balled up fist basically and so this fetus then is going to be attached and there's an umbilical cord of course that attaches it and that attaches to the placenta and there's also a mucus plug that forms and that mucus plug is at the level of the cervix and it serves to basically create a physical barrier in between the vagina and where the baby is developing in the uterus so this prevents bacteria from the lower reproductive tract from entering the upper reproductive tract where it could gain access to the developing embryo or fetus. Placentation is the development of a placenta. So first off, we have a connection, which is the body stock. So the body stock is the connection between the embryo and the chorion. And this has the distal parts of the allantois as well as the blood vessels that are going to take blood to and from the placenta. We also have the yolk stock developing, and the yolk stock is just a very narrow, thin connection between the endoderm of the embryo as well as the yolk sac. By week five, you're going to see some changes like the yolk stock and the umbilical stock fusing to become the umbilical stock, the very beginning of the umbilical cord. We also have three different types of decidua that change. We have capsular decidua, and what this is, is it's the part of the endometrium that the implanted conceptus has housed itself under. So because of that, this capsular decidua is what scoops out and around into the endometrial cavity around the conceptus. And so this very, very thin part of endometrium isn't going to have anything to do with the placenta. It has no nutrient exchange, and the chorionic villi, which are the typical tissue of a placenta, are going to disappear. The other decidua we have is the basal decidua, and this is a disc-shaped component that's deep to where the placenta would be in the endometrium. And so this is where our placental functions are going to be most concentrated. The parietal decidua is the remainder. That's all the rest of the uterine endometrium, and it has no contact with the chorion whatsoever. The umbilical cord includes the allantois, the placental blood vessels, and the yolk stock, and it connects the fetus to the placenta so that gas exchange and nutrient exchange can occur. Now, I have a really great trick for how you can remember what should be present on cross-section in the umbilical cord. The placental circulation includes blood flow coming through two paired arteries to the fetus. And then in return, there's a single umbilical vein. So we've got two arteries, one vein. How are you going to remember that it's not two veins in one artery? Well, if you look at this great little image below of this mug, this is terrible laboratory humor. So I apologize for this, but this is from which I hail. So anyway, so those are cross sections or transverse sections of h &E stained umbilical cord that you're looking at there. So every single one of them is a face. How do you feel today? Happy, sad, whatever. So you can see there that we have two eyes and a mouth. So the way that I've always thought of this is the two eyes are the two umbilical arteries and the one mouth is the umbilical vein. And one thing to remember is that veins are not as muscular as arteries, right? So because of that, veins can be all sorts of weird shapes. So hence, when you look at these images, you'll notice that the mouths are really different. Although honestly, the arteries, the two up top at the eyes, they're pretty much standard in almost all of these, give or take. So two arteries, one vein. Thank me later when you're taking your nursing exam. <laughs> Around week three, the beginning of the nervous system is occurring. And this starts as something called a neural tube. And so what you can see here on the left is week three, showing you the formation of the neural plate, which is formed by ectoderm. And you can see how in the center there, it's coming together. It's being pulled together by somites. 
And so then we end up having a complete tube. And that tube is going to house our central nervous system, including our brain, as also our spinal cord. So over on the right, I've included a clinical correlation for you of what happens if there is an incomplete closure of that tube, which we call a neural tube defect. We end up oftentimes with a child who may have spina bifida. And in this case, you see the image of the child laying on his belly. What he has on his back there is a protrusion of both the meninges around his spinal cord as well as the actual spinal cord itself is out exposed to the world. So this is crazy, right? It requires surgery. So what we're looking at here up at the top on the right is you can see the difference in what a spinal cord should look like on cross-section in an infant as opposed to in an infant who has spina bifida on the right or a myelomeningocele. You can see how those yellow strands of the cauda equina in this case are sticking out into that cystic structure exterior to the back. So this is why we specifically request that women take folic acid while they're pregnant because there's been a direct relationship formed between inadequate folic acid intake during pregnancy and the incidence of spina bifida. So by about week four of development, the embryo is going to be developmentally distinct from the embryonic disc and the extra embryonic membranes, as we saw in the previous slides. So there's a definitive orientation of the embryo at this point. You can see a head end and a tail end, if you want to think of it that way. And the image that you see over at the right, which is a fiber optic view of human development at week four, you can see a distinct head, the eye, and then the very beginnings of the limbs. The arm bud is the beginning of the arm, and the leg bud is the very beginning of the leg. So all of the events that occur in the first 12 weeks of conception allow for organogenesis, which is the formation of organs. Between weeks four and week 12, we have an awful lot of change occurring. So starting off in week four on the left, you can see that while this looks like it's definitely a structure that's probably alive, it doesn't particularly look very humanoid, right? And by week eight, you can see we definitely have an embryo that is taking on a much more humanoid appearance. Because look, at you have arms, you have hands, there are feet. All of these things are occurring. There's a definitive head end and a caudal end. All of this is apparent by week eight. And by week 12, I mean, my goodness, look, you can see the ribs forming. You can see the fingers in finer detail. There's a tremendous amount of growth that occurs in this period. And a lot of it includes organ development that occurs in the first trimester. And keep in mind, the differentiation between an embryo and a fetus is which week we're talking about. So after week nine, we're now we're going to be discussing a fetus. So the first two images on the left are embryos, but the image on the right at week 12 is a fetus. Now let's discuss section 29.5, the second and third trimesters. In the second trimester, you're going to see that the fetus starts to grow a whole lot faster than the surrounding placenta. In the very beginning, in the first trimester, we had a mad dash to create a placenta, so that way we would have that nutrient source and that gas exchange source. But now, once it's become developed, the fetus takes off like a rocket. And at this point, the amnion and the chorion fuse together, and they create a membrane called the amniochorionic membrane. In the third trimester, we have most of the organ systems pretty well developed, although they're not necessarily entirely mature. So they're able to function without maternal assistance, but this means that any baby that's delivered prematurely during the third trimester, well, the organs are there, they're not necessarily fully functional, so they may require additional care in something like a neonatal intensive care unit. Also, at this point, the growth rate kind of slows down, but the weight starts picking up considerably. And then the fetus, as well as the enlarged uterus, are really going to expand. And anybody who's been pregnant knows this, but it displaces many of the abdominal organs, including bowels. It flips the liver somewhat more horizontally anterior. It just displaces absolutely everything come the end of the third trimester. The critical period of development indicates that because we know that there are specific parts of the developing embryo or fetus, that develop at a specific time, that it's at the point when they're growing the most that they're the most vulnerable to insult. So an exposure to some sort of toxin at that point where a specific part is growing can result in a birth defect to that specific part of the body. High exposures to any toxin can result in termination, which is a miscarriage. But there's one caveat to that. 
during the first four weeks of pregnancy, they're largely considered the all or none period, meaning basically that exposures to a lot of toxins are not going to necessarily affect the viability or development of the actual conceptus. And this is primarily because that up until the point where we have the placenta developing to be a considerable relationship between the mother and the developing conceptus, until we get to that point, it's kind of on its own. Although keep in mind, of course, this is still a conceptus that is floating along in the body of another human. So there is always going to be some relationship there. But in the first four weeks, it's largely genetic and not so much related to exposures. So all of these exposures that you've seen listed here, I'm not going to read to you, but you get the idea that any exposure to any of these things can have a terrible impact and specifically on whatever it is that is developing at the time at which the exposure occurs. This chart demonstrates what the critical period of development is. And so it's showing you how an embryo to a fetus develops with certain parts developing at each time. And then those respective developing parts are going to be the most vulnerable to any toxic insult at the point at which they're growing. So in the first two weeks, you'll see that it's indicated at the bottom that really there's no susceptibility to teratogens here, that any toxic exposure would potentially result in prenatal death. And this is part of the all or none period, which actually extends up to about the fourth week. And then you'll note early on in weeks three through seven, as indicated on this chart, you see that there are major morphologic abnormalities if a toxic exposure occurs at this point. And why? Well, that's because most of the major body parts are forming at this time. And remember, by the time that we leave that first trimester, then we've got all of the major components of the body and organogenesis mostly underway. So at that point, they're not quite as susceptible to toxic exposure. So as you see over at the far right on the bottom, it says at that point, if there's a toxic exposure, that it could result in a physiologic defect or a minor morphologic abnormality to the point in question that's developing at that specific time. A teratogen is a substance that causes the malformation of a developing embryo or fetus. So there are three components to consider when you're thinking about what is the effect of the exposure to a specific teratogen. So the first is, what critical period of development are we in? Right? Because whatever is developing the most at that point is going to be the most susceptible to whatever insult that is exposed to because there is cell division, cell differentiation, and morphogenesis all occurring simultaneously. We also have to consider what dose are we looking at? Is it a high dose? Is it a low exposure? And then furthermore, to what, right? Is it a drug? Is it a chemical? Like all of that matters. And then the third thing that matters is what genotype does this embryo have? And might it be somehow more susceptible to this insult? So altogether, all three of these things are components of how teratogenesis actually displays itself. And what we're looking at here in this image on the right is an image of an infant with thalidomide phocomelia. And you can see here that the arms and the legs, too, are also very maldeveloped. So we have hands, but they're effectively coming out of the shoulders without the full length of the limbs that you would normally expect. And the reason for this is that the mother in utero had consumed a drug called thalidomide, which was something that I'm pretty sure was during the 70s was prescribed to women for morning sickness. And so as you can imagine, this was a really popular drug because a lot of women get morning sickness. So a lot of women took this, and if they took it at a specific point where the limb buds were developing, we end up with this phocomelia, which unfortunately is not something that can really be corrected postnatally. So thalidomide, by the way, fun note, our FDA did not allow thalidomide to be approved in the United States, although it was in Canada and also in the UK. So subsequent to that, you may have never heard about this until this day, but I'm from Canada and I did know about this because this did happen to people in a generation just a little bit older than myself because their mothers took thalidomide and it was allowed to be taken. So just keep this in mind. The FDA does try to do its best to keep us safe. So just wrapping up the second and third trimester discussion, I want to include this image here, which is a 3D ultrasound image of a six month fetus on the left. So on the left, this is from your textbook. And I just want to show you on the right that this was my picture of my little guy um, at the exact same time, by the way. So the images actually really do look like that. It's pretty cool. Now let's look at section 29.6. 
maternal gestational changes. In addition to providing gas exchange and nutrient exchange, the placenta is responsible for synthesizing a number of hormones by the syncytotropoblasts and releases those into the maternal bloodstream. There's human chorionic gonadotropin, human placental lactogen, placental prolactin, relaxin, progesterone, and estrogens. Now, keep in mind that the corpus luteum is going to continue to secrete progesterone and estrogen throughout that first trimester. And so because of that, it allows for time to basically be bought up until the placenta gets large enough to produce its own progesterone, which is important in maintaining the pregnancy. Now, I'll never forget this because for 10 weeks during IVF, I had to take an injection every day, it was intramuscular, of progesterone because through the process of going through IVF, I had no corpus, corpora lutea left in order to secrete any progesterone. Now, estrogens are going to be produced throughout the pregnancy, but the production goes up and increases considerably by the end of the third trimester, and that is thought to help facilitate labor and delivery. Human chorionic gonadotropin is one of the most important hormones produced by the placenta, by those syncytotropoblasts, and it is the basis of our pregnancy test, whether it be a urine test or a blood test, which we'll call a beta. But nonetheless, human chorionic gonadotropin will show up in the maternal bloodstream very shortly after implantation, and the amount that's present in the bloodstream is going to increase proportional to the development of that new placenta. So the HCG that's present in blood or urine is going to be a pretty reliable indication of pregnancy, and it's even more relevant when you see that the measurements go up and up and up, right? So early on in pregnancy, there is not a lot of placental tissue, and then another couple days later, it's fascinating to see how much more HCG has been produced. So you can see that any laboratory result, whether it's a urine test or blood test, will show a considerably increased rate. And so HCG is going to allow for the corpus luteum to last for three to four months. That buys a lot of time for the placenta to be big enough to produce all the other hormones that it needs to. The placenta also produces placental lactogen and prolactin. So placental lactogen just helps prepare mammary glands so that way they'll be adequately mature to produce milk. But it also has a stimulatory effect on other maternal tissues, and it's kind of similar to growth hormone. And so it basically just ensures that the glucose and the proteins are going to be available for the fetus to consume. The other thing the placenta produces via those syncytotropoblasts is placental prolactin. And what this does is different from lactogen. What it does is it helps to convert the mammary glands from their sort of dormant resting status into an active status. So placental prolactin is kind of like the on button for the mammary glands. The image, by the way, that you see on the right is what a gross placenta looks like. And so on the left, we have the fetal side. And by fetal side, that's what actually faces the fetus, no matter what position it's in, in the uterus, because you can see that there's the umbilical cord in the center of it that attaches directly to the abdomen of the fetus. And then the other picture on the right is what is called the maternal side. And so that would be what attaches to the maternal uterine wall. This is probably a joke that indicates how much older I am than the rest of you, but relaxing. Um, this is something that I always associated with this song off of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air's theme song. <laughs> but anyway, relaxin is just a peptide hormone. It's secreted by the placenta, again, those syncytotropoblasts, and also by the corpus luteum during pregnancy. And all it does is it relaxes our joints and ligaments, so that way we have much more flexibility as mothers to be able to pass a large infant through the birth canal. So what that means is that the pubic symphysis becomes more flexible and pulls apart. And a lot of women who are pregnant will indicate that towards the end of their pregnancy, they can really feel the weight of that on their pelvic bones at the anterior inferior aspect where they fuse. So that stretches out and that also helps to support the dilatation of the cervix. So that gives an additional more space for the fetus to pass. Relaxin also suppresses the release of oxytocin, and so that delays the onset of labor contractions somewhat as well. During pregnancy, the developing fetus is completely dependent on the maternal systems for everything, for nourishment, so this includes nutrients and respiration, so it's gas exchange, and waste removal as well. So as a result, the maternal system is going to have to have a number of adaptations to be able to accommodate for this new need. 
So first off, the respiratory rate and tidal volume increase considerably. And what this means is functionally, you breathe more and you breathe deeper and bigger so that we are taking in more air, more oxygen, and therefore the mother has enough oxygen to both support herself as well as the developing fetus. The blood volume of the mother also expands almost 50%. And then the nutrient intake goes up, which means we eat more, right? We're hungrier. Makes sense. We're not just supporting our own body. We're actually growing a whole new one. The glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure of renal function, goes up by 50%. And the size of the uterus and the mammary glands grow considerably during this time. First, let's look at the image on the left. So you'll see here an image of a 16-week pregnancy, very standard looking. You can note where the relationship is of the fundus or the top of the uterus to all the other structures in this image. Now next, let's look over at the image on the right. And you're gonna see a curved line indicating what correlates roughly to the fundal height of the uterus at different points in pregnancy. And you can see very clearly as you go up so many centimeters per month, give or take, you get up really quite high. By the time that a baby is full term at nine months, you'll see that the fundal height is right up under the xiphoid process. And so you'll note also there's a dotted line there. And that dotted line is indicating that the baby has quote unquote dropped, which is when the baby assumes the position that's appropriate for delivery by dropping into the maternal birth canal. So at this point, you'll see that it drops from the nine month height to roughly give or take about the eight or maybe 7.5 month height. In the image on the left here, what we're looking at is a non-pregnant normal woman standing erect in anatomic position, showing you a sectional view so you can see the way the organs are all laid out. So I'd like to point out something here just for your note. One, let's look where the uterus is, see where that is down by the bottom middle. And then also if you look up at the very top, look at where the liver is, that's also pretty normal. Also, I want you to take a note of the bladder, by the way, which is just anterior to the uterus, right? Now let's look over to the image on the right. So this is a full term infant with a woman standing with a baby in situ. And so you can see the way things are laid out. So first off, note that all of the small intestines are all pushed up considerably, which is one of the reasons why women experience constipation during pregnancy. You can also see the stomach is compressed, which is one of the reasons why women eat lots of little snacks, but not a giant big meal when they become full term because there just isn't enough space really. Also, the liver you can see is pressed up. It's going to be pressed up anterior and flipped almost forward. You're going to note the bladder that you can see that it's compressed upon because the weight of the baby literally is sitting right on top of the top of the bladder. So there's a broad number of different changes, including even pressure on blood vessels that normally wouldn't be compressed. So this requires a ton of anatomic changes, some of which we just discussed. Okay, let's discuss 29-7, childbirth. In labor and delivery, labor is the work involved that includes those strong contractions in the uterus that are rhythmic, and that helps to be able to expel the fetus. Parturition is the actual delivery of the child through a forcible expulsion of the fetus from the uterus. Later on in pregnancy, a lot of women experience false labor or Braxton Hicks contractions. And so what this is, is when a woman experiences contractions or spasms in the uterine muscle, and they're not exactly regular or persistent, but they can sometimes come at bizarre timing intervals. So it's hard to understand what's going on. So the general consensus is, if you're ever not sure, call your OB. And if you can't get a hold of your OB, go to the hospital. Now, true labor is going to be initiated by a number of factors, both fetal and placental. And really interestingly, the fetal pituitary gland secretes oxytocin, which is considered to be a potential trigger for the onset of true labor, because what it does is it increases the contractions of the mimetrium and also increases prostaglandin production. True labor is part of a positive feedback loop and they start at the top of the uterus or the superior portion of the fundus, and then it sweeps down inferiorly towards the cervix. So this helps to press the baby down. So they'll increase over time in both force and frequency, and that helps to move the fetus towards the cervical canal. There are three stages of labor, dilation, expulsion, and the placental stage. Let's discuss these three stages. 
So later on in pregnancy, towards the end of the third trimester, there will be both maternal effacement and dilation of the cervix, but only a little bit. And so this is something indicating that the body is getting ready for delivery, but it is not truly the dilation stage. So the dilation stage will begin with the onset of true labor. And this is when the cervix dilation starts to pick up speed. So at this point, the fetus is going to shift down into the cervical canal. Hence, this is when the baby drops, right, which I showed you that image showing you where the fundal height was. So this is where it goes from like month nine to about month seven and a half. And this period of time is really variable. So usually it lasts for about eight or more hours. And during this time, the contractions start increasing in their frequency. And then later on the stage, you'll find that the water breaks, which is the amniochorionic membrane. Finally, the cervix, after dilating for a number of hours, reaches about 10 centimeters, which is complete dilation. At this point now, the contractions are also at a maximum intensity to be able to press the baby down and out. And so these contractions will continue until the fetus has finally emerged from the vagina, and this stage typically takes about less than two hours. During the placental stage, the muscle tension in the wall of the uterus is going to build up, and the connections in between the endometrium and the placenta tear, which results in a considerable loss of blood. This occurs roughly within about an hour of delivery, and it's known as, by the way, both the placenta, or in lay terms, the afterbirth. So one of the primary reasons why post pardon women have that uterine massage is to help to stimulate the uterus to basically stop bleeding to reduce the amount of blood loss by the mother. Here's a clinical correlation for the expulsion stage. An episiotomy is commonly performed, although not regularly, if additional space is required at the perineum to allow for passage of the infant. So in this case, there's an incision through the perineal musculature, and you can see that there's two different ways of doing this. There's the midline incision that you see on the left, and then the more lateral or medial lateral incision on the right. And so this will provide for more space for a more rapid delivery if this is specifically appropriate for speeding up this specific delivery. It's sutured up afterwards. It can be a number of different degrees, whether it's involving just the skin or if it's involving muscular tissue or deeper tissue. But either way, this is something that is done with a pair of scissors with a snap. This is not a gentle, smooth, incisional cut like what you might think it might be. It's not a delicate procedure. It's a very fast get the baby out maneuver. Several times after delivery, the newborn's health will be assessed in five different areas in terms of their heart rate, their breathing, their skin color, their muscle tone, and their response to reflex. So for each of those different criteria that you see in the chart on the right, each of those areas will get a score from zero to two. And then we add it all up to get a total score that gives a gestalt number of how well is this baby faring postnatally. So what we have is a score of zero to three will be severely depressed, moderately depressed is about four to six, and anywhere from seven or eight to ten will be a really excellently healthy baby. A premature labor is defined as whenever labor begins before the fetus is completely developed. So at this point, the chances of survival for the newborn are proportional to their body weight at birth. So we break this down to the categories of whether it's an immature delivery or a premature delivery. Premature delivery is later, and so that's in between 28 to 36 weeks, at which point the baby is maybe developed, but not fully, and not fully mature, that's for sure. So with considerable medical intervention, the newborns will have a pretty good chance of surviving, and everything should go along swimmingly if your fingers are crossed. Now, immature delivery is going to be when a fetus is born between 25 to 27 weeks of gestation. And at this point, they'll require considerable medical intervention and probably stay in a neonatal intensive care facility for a number of weeks, if not months. And even following that, many may die and the survivors at this time may go on to have considerable developmental disability. Deliveries aren't always smooth. In fact, sometimes they're quite difficult and require additional support to get the baby out. 
So one of the mechanisms available, and this is kind of an old school mechanism, is a forceps delivery. And this is different than the forceps we would use to take out a splinter or a sliver from our skin. These are these big, enormous contraptions that are basically like giant metal tubes that wrap around sides of the baby's skull. So these will be inserted in the vagina around the fetal head, and then they're used to pull down on the head of the fetus intermittently at the time of contraction to help ease the baby out. And getting the baby out this way will reduce risk to both the infant for being in potentially longer than it should if there are any complications, and also to the mother. But these are primarily used when the fetus faces anteriorly towards the mother's pubis instead of posteriorly towards the sacrum. The most common and the proper position for a baby to be in at delivery is called OA or occiput anterior, referring to the back of the head faces anterior to the mother. So in that position, the head is down, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the baby is in the opposite position in which the head is up and the feet or the bottom are facing down first. So in this case, either the buttocks or the legs are going to enter the vaginal canal first. And this complicates delivery considerably because in this position, it's possible for the umbilical cord to get pinched. And when that happens, it cuts off all blood flow to and from the placenta and therefore also to and from the fetus at the same time. Also, by the way, a leg or foot may be able to make it partly out, pinching the umbilical cord, and the cervix may not dilate largely enough to be able to pass the head. So a breech birth can prolong delivery and it creates more distress and also it creates a potential for more injury to occur as well. By the way, the in Pardon me, the image on the right of the transverse lie, this is what my poor mother had to do when she was delivering my brother. He was 10 pounds and 8 ounces, and he was a transverse lie, and anyway, it was a terribly traumatic delivery. He turned out all right, but nonetheless, it was still an awful tear to her uterine wall requiring surgery and hysterectomy afterwards. So getting the baby in the proper position has a lot of benefit for both the baby and the mother. A C-section, or cesarean section, is the surgical removal of an infant through the abdominal and uterine wall via an incision, not through the vaginal birth canal. This occurs in almost one out of every three deliveries in the United States, and it was very popular previously because it allowed for ease of scheduling for the delivery of a child. However, there's considerable reason to consider pursuing a vaginal delivery instead. And in fact, many hospitals will not regularly schedule cesarean sections unless there is an absolute medical necessity for that scheduling. So these are done for a number of reasons. And typically, there are risk factors that could include injury to either the infant or to the mother. So this includes the mother being of advanced maternal age, which is over the age of 40, being diabetic, or being obese, or also if there are multiple births. Speaking of multiple births, let's discuss dizygotic twins as compared to monozygotic twins. So first, let's break down the word. Di meaning two, mono meaning one, and zygotic meaning pertaining to the zygote. So in dizygotic twins, we have two zygotes, and in monozygotic twins, we have one zygote. So if we have one zygote but two individuals, they have to be the same, right? Because they come from the same zygote. So this results from either separation of the blastomeres early on in cleavage, or also through splitting of the inner cell mass before gastrulation occurs. And this results in two totally identical individuals genetically. And this is because they both came from the same pair of gametes. Now, dizygotic twins are fraternal twins, and they have the same genetic makeup as a brother and sister or two brothers might from the same two parents. So these are developed from two totally separate oocytes and two totally separate sperm. Multiple births aren't terribly common, but they're not that unusual either. So twins will occur in one of every 89 births. Triplets will occur in one out of every 7,921 births. And quadruplets are considerably more rare. They only occur in one out of every 704,000 births. Conjoined twins are when you have genetically identical twins, but however, the blasphemers or the embryonic discs 
didn't complete or split properly, so you end up with attachment with any number of different points. They can be attached either at the head or at the thorax or any number of different locations. So if you do a Google of conjoined twins, you'll see all sorts of different surgical attempts to separate individuals. And yet, keep in mind, there are some that because of the organs that they share can never be separated. So it's something fascinating to read up on if you're interested and have the time. Section 29.8, postnatal stages. Life is a cycle, right? It starts off with a neonatal period and then moves into infancy. And then infancy translates into toddlerhood and childhood. Childhood evolves into adolescence or the teenage years, which results in a mature adult individual, finally. But then we have the process of aging known as senescence that occurs, which starts at the beginning of maturity, which marks the end of development. So either you are on the way up and developing, or you are on the downward slope, basically. And senescence, of course, ultimately leads to death. The definition of these life stages is as follows. The neonatal period lasts from birth at whatever point that occurs through to one month of age. Infancy will extend from that one month of age all the way up to the end of the first year of life. Childhood is defined as the period of infancy until adolescence, so that's a pretty long stretch. And then adolescence is marked by puberty, so this is the period that's defined by sexual and physical maturation occurring. During the neonatal period, infancy, and childhood, there are two major events that occur. And the first is that most of our organ systems become fully operational. The second is that this individual will grow very rapidly, and during this time, the body proportions change considerably. Early on, the head takes up a considerable amount of the length of the body, but by the time we're an adult, our head is only about roughly one-ninth or one-tenth of our entire body length. Pediatrics is the medical specialty that studies specifically postnatal development from infancy through to adolescence. The neonatal period is marked as the transition that lasts from the period of being a fetus through to being a neonate or a newborn. And during this time, a number of systems start functioning independently for the first time. The respiratory system starts breathing air, the circulatory system functions independently, the digestive system is responsible for consuming food and digesting it and then excreting it, and then the urinary system also has to come into operation. So all these things occur during the neonatal period, and also the ability to control our own body temperature kicks in. But all of this is contingent upon nutrients that are provided in milk. After a mother first delivers a neonate, colostrum will be secreted from the mammary glands just for the first two to three days postpartum. And in this time, the colostrum is a very small amount of content and it alarms the vast majority of mothers because they think they're not producing enough breast milk. But their quote unquote milk hasn't come in yet. This is colostrum, which is different. It has more protein and less fat. So during this time, this is incredibly valuable to breastfeed the child, even though it's not a full supply of food or a meal like you might think of. But what it does is it provides a ton of protein antibodies. And so those antibodies are important for an infant who doesn't have the ability to produce these sorts of antibodies on their own yet. So this basically provides the immune system for the infant until the infant is mature enough to produce its own. Mucins are also present here, and that also helps to prevent the replication of rotaviruses, which are a common source of illness. Colostrum production will drop, and as this occurs, there will be less antibody in the milk, although not none. In breast milk, there is always a supporting amount of antibody. But this is the point at which it transfers over from producing colostrum to mature milk production. Breast milk is comprised of primarily water, but also protein, some amino acids, lipids, sugars, and salts. In other words, pretty much everything that that infant needs. And so it also includes something called lysozyme, which is an enzyme that has some antibiotic properties. The milk letdown reflex, or the milk ejection reflex, is triggered when the infant sucks on the nipple. And this will continue to function until weaning, which is usually sometime between one to two years after birth.
And so you can see in figure 2912 that this starts off with the stimulation of the tactile receptors in the nipple. And what this does is sends a neural impulse that propagates the spinal cord and finally to the brain, which then allows for oxytocin to be secreted by the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, which is the neurohypothesis, right? And so that oxytocin release then helps to basically get everything going. It distributes oxytocin throughout the body. And then finally, that oxytocin will reach the mammary gland. And when that happens, the muscle epithelial cells or the myoepithelial cells in the wall of those milk ducts and sinuses will start to contract. And so what that means is at that point, the milk that has been produced in the breast will actually be let down or rejected. During infancy and childhood, growth occurs under the direction of a number of different hormones in circulation, growth hormone, the adrenal steroids, and the thyroid hormones. But growth isn't going to occur totally uniformly. There might be starts and fits over time, which is why we say somebody is going through a growth spurt, quote unquote. And over time, the proportions of the body change considerably from being an infant through towards the end of childhood. Puberty is defined as the period of sexual maturation, and that marks the very beginning of adolescence. So this can start at about age 11 in girls and 12 in boys, although honestly, lately, this has been something that's been reducing considerably and might be starting even sooner. The hypothalamus will increase its production of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and circulating levels of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone both shoot up rapidly. So during this time, then the ovarian or the testicular cells, depending on which gender we're discussing, will become more sensitive to those two hormones that are circulating, the FSH and the LH. And then the hormone changes will provide our sex-specific differences in systems throughout our entire body. Senescence is the natural product of aging, and it reduces the functional capabilities of an individual by affecting a large number of systems throughout the body. This affects homeostatic mechanisms, and it changes things at the molecular level. And these molecular level changes ultimately will lead to death eventually. So geriatrics is the medical specialty that specifically addresses problems that are associated with aging. So geriatricians are the professional name for physicians who are trained specifically in geriatrics. Next, let's discuss section 29.9 the last section of the last chapter of the last lecture in Biology 205, 299, Patterns of Inheritance. We've already covered genetics in an earlier chapter. So you recall that chromosomes are what contains DNA and the proteins, and then that the genes are those segments of DNA on the chromosome that has information that's directing the development of a specific polypeptide. So now the genotype and phenotype sound similar, but they're actually kind of different. So the genotype is referring to the actual genetic makeup of an individual, whereas the phenotype is more, what does that look like? So the genotype is the chromosomes and their genes, and then the way that those instructions are set out could be expressed variably. So it could be expressed in a way that's very you know, florid and you know, obvious, or is expressed in a way this subtle and more minor. And then the genotype is also going to be responsible for determining the anatomic and physiologic characteristics because those things develop based on genotypic information. Now, the phenotype will describe the anatomical and the physiological characteristics. So what does it look like, again? And this results from the combination of the genotype and also the environment. Every non-gamete cell in our body has 23 pairs of chromosomes, one contributed by the ovum and one contributed by the sperm. So these somatic cells are all throughout our body. And of those 23 pairs of chromosomes and all those cells, 22 of those are going to be called autosomes. And the autosomes are basically everything that's included in all those chromosomes minus the one set the 23rd pair that are sex chromosomes. So those are different, right? This is one is the X and one is the Y. So the X is contributed by the ovum and the Y is contributed by the sperm. All the rest physiologically look the same size and they match up. So those are the homologous chromosomes. And those are going to be numbers one through 22 of the 23 pairs of chromosomes.
Figure 2914 is a karyotype, which is the entire layout of all of the chromosomes in a single individual. So what I'd like to draw your attention to is when you look at this image, you'll note that each of these sets of chromosomes is numbered 1 through 22. And if you look at each of those 1 through 22s, you're going to see very perfectly matching colors and size and shape because these are equal sets. They both have the same genetic information layout. But then when you look at the next set, there's the X and the Y. So the X is contributed by the ovum and the Y is contributed by the sperm. And this is because females are typically XX and males are typically XY. So that means that only males possess a Y and therefore only Ys can pass it on because women who are XX, we just don't have a Y to give. Locus refers to the position of a gene on the chromosome. And alleles are going to be those various forms of any given gene. And so the various alleles are what contributes to the effect on the gene and therefore the effect on the phenotype. So first it affects the overall genetics and then it affects the way the genetics are projected into the tissues creating a physical presentation. In our somatic cells, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 of those pairs are the autosomal cells, which are homologous. And then the other one pair are going to be the sex chromosomes. So of those homologous chromosomes that are the autosomes, they will either be homozygous or heterozygous. They are homozygous if the two alleles are basically the same for the same particular gene. However, if they're different, then they will be considered heterozygous. So the heterozygous situation is interesting because the phenotype that results isn't always just one and done. It can vary considerably based on a number of other factors, including the interaction between other alleles. So if you look at the image at the right here, this is a standard family tree that's going to be drawn out any time you talk with a genetic counselor. And what we're looking up at the very, very top is we have an originating couple and their offspring, and then their offspring's offspring. So basically, you can think of grandparents, parents, and children in that order. So we have three generations. The key at the bottom indicates the square is going to be a male and the circle is a female. And then we have two different colors, the blue or the red. And so if somebody is solid red, what we're saying here is that they are homozygous, meaning they're both carrying that red allele. And then if they're heterozygous, they'll have one blue and one red. Okay, so what we're looking at at the very top is a mother and a father here who are both heterozygous for a specific allele. So in their offspring, in that second generation, you'll note that at the far, far left, starting with their very first child, that would be the second individual in, which is actually their first daughter. Their first daughter is solid blue, so she is a homozygous blue daughter. And then as we move over, there's a homozygous son, and then there's a carrier daughter, right? And that's when it's half blue and half red. And then finally, at the very end, the last son is a red square, and so this is a homozygous male. So that's the general way that you would read one of these trees. This image is the exact same one that we looked at in the previous slide. And what it's demonstrating is a concept called simple inheritance. And simple inheritance is really just when the phenotype is determined just by the interactions between a single pair of alleles. So in this case, the phenotype would be either be blue, red, or 50-50, right, being heterozygous. So you're either homozygous red, homozygous blue, or heterozygous, meaning you have one allele of red and one allele of blue. In simple inheritance, we're just looking at one set of alleles. And so the way that this will present phenotypically is broken down into either strict dominance, codominance, or incomplete dominance. So in strict dominance, any allele that's dominant is going to be expressed phenotypically regardless of anything else whatsoever. Now, if it's a recessive allele, that means that it's only going to be expressed if both the maternal and the paternal alleles are the same on both chromosomes. Okay, in codominance, you can have heterozygous individuals, so you can have one blue, one red, and then the individual will exhibit the presentation phenotypically of both. And in incomplete dominance, then it's a little bit different yet. So this is when you have also a heterozygous set of alleles, so one blue and one red, and it produces a phenotype that isn't so clear. It's kind of in between. I'll discuss this a little bit more in the subsequent slides. In order to predict simple inheritance, we can use a tool called a Punnett square. 
And so this is an example here on the left of one parent with brown eyes and one parent with blue eyes. And then what are the chances of their offspring having different colored eyes, whether they'd be brown or blue? And so what you'll note here is that the parent with brown eyes has a homozygous set of dominant genes here. So we know it's dominant because it's a capitalized letter. And then at the top, we have the blue-eyed parent, and we can see that this parent is also homozygous, but they're homozygous for the recessive allele, not for the dominant one. So how this matches up. So what this means effectively is that because both parents are homozygous, this means that that specific allele is going to be given to 100% of their offspring. So you can see that the brown-eyed parent in all four settings here always contributes a capital B or a dominant B. And then you can see that the top parent who's blue-eyed, this parent obviously only has the opportunity to pass on the blue-eyed allele, which is that lowercase recessive gene. So because both parents are homozygous, both parents can only provide one specific allele, which means that 100% of their offspring is going to have one from each of them. So one will be the capital B, one will be the lowercase b. Capital B is the dominant allele, and the lowercase b is the recessive allele. So when you have both a dominant and a recessive allele together in simple inheritance and strict dominance, that's going to mean that the phenotype or the appearance is going to be brown-eyed because the brown is the dominant allele in this setting. So let's compare this with the image on the right. In the next Punnett square, we have a parent at the top with blue eyes who is homozygous recessive for blue eyes, which is pretty standard for the most part. And then what you see is the parent on the left. Now this parent has brown eyes, but you'll note that this person is heterozygous and not homozygous because they have a lowercase dominant B, which is dominant over the recessive lowercase B for blue. And therefore the phenotype of this parent is brown eyes. So when you put together this Punnett square to lay out what are all the possible permutations of offspring that these two individuals could have, what you'll note is that the homozygous blue-eyed parent always contributes the recessive blue allele because they are homozygous and that's all that they can provide. And then the heterozygous parent, that's the one who throws in the wild card here, because you'll note that about half the time, you're going to see that the dominant allele for brown eyes is provided the offspring, and about the other half of the time, the recessive blue-eyed gene, or sorry, blue-eyed allele is provided to the offspring. So this results in 50% of the offspring having the recessive allele, which is blue-eyed, and then 50% of the offspring being heterozygous, but still having brown eyes because that brown allele is dominant. Simple inheritance looks at one set of alleles, one maternal, one paternal, and then how the phenotype is produced is based off of what type of dominance we have, whether it's strict dominance, co-dominance, or incomplete dominance. But not everything is as simple and straightforward as the Punnett squares we just looked at with just one allele only. Most of the time, Honestly, there's going to be polygenic inheritance, meaning that there are a whole number of different interactions that occur among several genes, and therefore you can't really predict the phenotype so clearly using a Punnett square. So this gives you an example down at the bottom here of an image showing you that there are three different sets of dominant genes here, A, B, and C capitalized, and then there are three of the lowercase recessive genes, A, B, and C, and then this shows you the likelihood of what presentation would be based upon whether the person had the dominant or the recessive gene. And then you can see there's a breakdown too, showing you something looks like a very standard deviation type chart, showing you a bell curve of what the distribution would be. In polygenic inheritance, we have a couple other complicating factors. So one is called suppression, in which one gene literally suppresses the expression of the other. So therefore that second gene that's been suppressed will have no phenotypic impact whatsoever. So it won't affect the overall phenotype of the individual. The other complicating factor is complementary gene action. And this is when we have dominant alleles on two genes and they come together to produce a phenotype that's gonna be different than what you would see when one gene contains recessive alleles. Thus far, we've discussed on the autosomes, which are the 22 sets of homologous chromosomes, We've talked about simple inheritance, but we also have something called sex-linked inheritance, which is anything that's basically carried on either the X chromosome or the Y chromosome. And so the X chromosome is considerably larger than the Y chromosome, and therefore it has a lot more genetic material and more genes just numerically as well.
So 100% of oocytes are going to be carrying X chromosomes because females are typically XX. Males are typically XY, so therefore the Y chromosome can only be provided by the father. And so this includes a gene that specifies that the individual will become male, and the Y is never produced by the female because women are XX carriers only. So interesting side story, you probably have heard about King Henry VIII in England and how he's killed several of his wives for not producing sons. Well, that's on him because it's physically impossible for a female to produce a son without the male producing the Y chromosome. So that was actually on him, but it was still an excuse for him to get rid of some of his wives he didn't want anymore. Again, it's the sperm that can carry the Y chromosome, but they can also carry the X chromosome. So when the sperm provides an X to the ovum, then that will result in a daughter. But if the sperm carries the Y chromosome, then that will result in the male. So males will have one of each and they can pass along either one. And the X-linked genes are going to be those genes that are only found on the X chromosome and they're not present on the Y. So X chromosomes will affect somatic structures, but the inheritance pattern isn't the same pattern that we just discussed in simple inheritance of autosomal chromosomes. When we discuss sex-linked patterns of inheritance, which are different than the autosomal patterns of inheritance, we have to remember that we don't have homologous chromosomes all the time, because in males, they have the X and the Y, and as you can see here, the Y does not look like the same shape as the X. It's considerably smaller. The mother, however, is a typical female here with two Xs, which are homologous. So this example that we're looking at is demonstrating an X-linked dominant theory here. And so what is happening is that the father does not carry this allele of interest and therefore is not affected by the specific disease. However, the mother is. So she is carrying that one and it is heterozygous, but because it's dominant, she is affected fully by it. So now let's look at the offspring. So you can see that there's a 50-50 chance that whatever the mother gives will be that dominant allele. So 50% of the time, it will be that red X-linked dominant allele, and 50% of the time, it will be that blue recessive allele. So any of the children that she has that she passes on that X to, that is the blue recessive allele, these are going to be unaffected children. And then any of the children that she passes on the X-linked dominant allele to, because that will be the X on both the daughter and the son, and it's dominant, therefore both of those children will be affected by this particular disease that we're discussing. So now you'll note that the father, though, does not carry that dominant allele. So any daughter that he provides an X to will not have that allele at all. But it's a 50-50 shot for the mother. Next, let's look at what X-linked recessive looks like in contrast to this. In the X-linked recessive setting, what we have here is a mother who is heterozygous again, but because this red X-linked allele is recessive as opposed to being dominant, that means that there are two copies required. So somebody has to be heterozygous in order to be affected. But the thing is, because this is X-linked as opposed to autosomal, it's different. So let's see how this plays out. So the father, first off, is unaffected. So any of his offspring, basically, whether they are male or female, will not carry that X-linked allele. But the mother, because she carries this, will give it to her offspring, again, with a 50-50 distribution. But you'll note that the difference is whether she has a son or a daughter and whether or not they're affected. So the daughter will have, 50% of the time, that red X-linked recessive allele. But she'll also get the dominant allele, this blue, from her father. So in that case, because she has that red, which would be causing whatever disease that we're discussing here, because she's heterozygous and it's recessive, she's unaffected. But she's a carrier and can pass it on to the next generation. Now, the son here, to the right of that unaffected carrier daughter, is affected. And the reason why, even though he, pardon me, even though he is only heterozygous for this one specific X-linked recessive allele is because that other gene is not homologous. It's not an autosome. It's a sex chromosome. So that means that it's on his X. It's on 100% of his X's because he only has one X. The other sex chromosome he has is a Y. So because of that, that son will be affected. The other two children that you see on the left are getting the dominant allele from the mother and also the dominant allele from the father, and therefore both of them are unaffected. 
any of you in the room that have siblings realize that you're probably not exactly the same as your siblings in probably myriad ways. And that's because there's a lot of sources of individual variation. So first off, during meiosis, the maternal and the paternal chromosomes are going to be randomly distributed. So that's why you and your siblings will be very similar genetically, but not quite the same. And then also, each gamete that is formed is going to have a unique combination of both the maternal and the paternal chromosomes, so that allows for variation. Genetic recombination also supports this. So that way, during meiosis, there are a bunch of changes that occur, and this affects the chromosome structure. This results in gametes that are produced that have chromosomes that are different from those of each parent. And so what this does is it increases the genetic variation among all of the gametes. One type of genetic recombination is crossing over. So what you can see here in the image to the right is you have these two chromosome sets sitting here. And then when they cross over at part B, you're going to see that part of the chromatids end up exchanging material. So that way, by the time we get to image C here at recombination, you'll note that the purple chromosome here has given some of its information over to the blue and vice versa. So they've swapped. So in this case, this would be called a translocation, where the material that's genetic is being swapped between two non-homologous chromosomes, but it's crossing over when it's occurring within two homologous chromosomes. Things don't always go exactly as planned. So chromosomal abnormalities, unfortunately, are a reality that are present in about 10% of zygotes, and most of these are not going to survive that first four-week period. So in this case, we'll see things like damaged chromosomes or broken chromosomes. Sometimes there are even extra copies or absent copies of chromosomes as well. And so this will be present in almost 0.5% of all newborns, and it produces a broad, wide variety of clinical complications for these patients. Sometimes specific genes are present in an individual, but that individual won't be phenotypically matching their genotype. And the reason for this can be because of things like chromosomal aberrations or deletions, but there can also be situations such as genomic imprinting in which the DNA isn't itself changed, but it results in these very specific changes that adjust whether or not specific genes will be turned on or off. So basically, will that gene be expressed or not? So genomic imprinting is essentially volume control on our genetic information. Epigenetics is a fascinating line of study, which I really encourage you to look into. And what it is, is the study of traits that are inherited, but it's not due to changes in the genotype. It's specifically due to things that could be, for example, environmental, that could affect whether or not a gene is expressed or not. So, for example, I'm just throwing out there a random idea. Hypothetically, let's say if somebody's exposed to a toxin, without naming any specific ones, let's think about industrial toxins, if you're exposed to a specific toxin, that could actually serve to either activate this genomic imprinting to either dial up or dial down whether or not a gene is expressed, and that could theoretically result in malignancy. So we talk about malignancy as coming from a two-hit hypothesis. The first hit is the genotype, and the second hit would be the environmental exposure. So in this case, the environmental exposure basically then turns on or turns off or dials up or dials down whether or not a specific gene is expressed, and then there's a phenotypic change. Mutations can be common, and these are just changes in the nucleotide sequences of any specific allele. These can occur spontaneously, resulting from just a random error in DNA as it's being replicated. And so most of the times, this is going to be a little error. It can be detected, and it gets cleaned up, so the enzymes are able to repair this specific error in DNA replication. However, sometimes these errors or mutations are larger or they can go undetected. So if they're not repaired, then that has the potential to change the phenotype of the individual. And further, these mutations, if they affect some cells, and specifically if they affect our germline cells, that can affect our gametes. Let's review some of the information that we've just looked at in the textbook and also in this lecture. So carriers are gonna be those individuals who are heterozygous for a specific allele, but they don't show the effects of that mutation. So what this means is that it's kind of like they're a hidden carrier of a specific, let's say, disease. 
Now, penetrance is different. Penetrance is referring to specifically the percentage of individuals who have a specific genotype and that they actually show what you would expect phenotypically. So penetrance is discussed in your textbook with an example about emphysema, which is really fascinating. So emphysema is linked to a specific genotype, but about 20% of the people who have that genotype don't develop emphysema, so what that means is the remaining 80% do. So therefore, the penetrance of that genotype is about 80%. So there are environmental factors that kick in here, right? So people who smoke cigarettes are very likely to develop emphysema, or at least you could say they're much more likely than the non-smoking population to develop emphysema, but not everybody will, because we don't know whether you're carrying a specific genotype or not. So this is one of the reasons why people will say, you know, hey, my grandfather smoked a pack a day since he was 13 years old and he never got cancer, so it can't be that bad. Well, okay, so maybe he was that lucky guy who didn't have that specific genotype, but it's more common that people who do smoke will, of course, develop smoking-related diseases, including malignancy. Expressivity is the extent to which a specific allele is going to be expressed if it's present. So how bad is it, really, is kind of what we're saying here. And teratogens, just to review again, these are the factors that result in abnormal development. And that includes things like nicotine, alcohol, tranquilizers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Lastly, if I can impress anything upon you, is that the human genome is fascinating. Our entire genetic material... Our DNA is present in our chromosomes, and this includes 3.2 billion base pairs, and that includes 20 to 25,000 protein coding genes. So about 10,000 of these specific gene disorders have been described so far, but there's more being discovered all the time. Gene therapy is an exciting new technology in which we can actually insert corrective genes into a patient's cells to actually genetically address the cause of whatever the disease or malady might be. So this can be used to treat genetic disorders or diseases. Figure 2919 in your text is amazing. This is a map breaking down some, and this is just some, of the more common different things that occur on the chromosomes. And it's mapped out, as you can see, in a clockwise fashion, just for ease of being able to review all this information. So you can see just off the bat in chromosome pair one, you can see that this is a site where we've determined that prostate cancer may arise from. And also it could be the location of Gaucher disease, which is a lysosomal storage disease, which you'll definitely learn about when you take pathophysiology. But so this gives you an idea of how we know that there are specific locations for a broad variety of different types of diseases, and we're just getting started. All right, that's it. That concludes our regularly scheduled program of the Biology 205 lecture series. So thank you so much for your attention, and thank you for being the people who decide to help others even when it's hard, and especially when it's hard. It makes me so deeply, deeply grateful to have the opportunity to be able to be your professor. So please reach out to me in the future if you need me, and I know you're all looking forward to the point in your education where you get to take your graduation photos. I know it won't quite look like this nursing photo that you see here, but nonetheless, I'm really looking forward to seeing yours, and I hope you'll share them with me when you do get them taken. So anyway, good luck in the future, and I just want to tell you one last thing while we're here, and if you don't mind indulging me, this image that you're looking at here is Miss A. Wilson, and this was a nursing student and her graduation photo, of course. This was back in the early 1970s, and she had graduated from nursing school in a two-year pilot program that was never run again because it was such an intense program. Following that, becoming a full nurse, an RN, at 19 years old, she ended up working in labor and delivery, pediatrics, neonatal intensive care for a number of years, and then entered into management and became a manager of a floor, a patient floor coordinator, and supervisor of the entire hospital. So this is my mom. This is somebody who I'm incredibly proud of, and she is the sort of person who rushes into a burning building to help others and always puts other people first. So that's the kind of heart it takes to go into nursing, and that's why I'm so proud of you. Anyway, that's it. I'll stop being mushy now, but please go on, do great in 206, and tell them I sent you. All right, bye.